video uh, for chapter six. So we, in the first video, we discussed um, subset selection methods, and this video I'm going to talk about two different uh, shrinkage methods. So the, let me tell you the idea behind uh, the shrinkage method. The shrinkage methods are trying to find a method or model by which they um, they actually um, force some of the variables become zero. So what they usually do, they, they consider full model, um, which was beta zero plus beta one x one plus beta two x two and so on and so forth. You consider full model then you do something to your model such that when it tries to estimate these parameters from beta 0 to beta p, it makes sure it converts uh, some of these betas to 0. And that's called the shrinkage method. And that's a very these are some very powerful methods and uh, specifically lasso is extremely powerful nowadays and being used all the time. So let me explain what uh, these methods are. I think it's a good time to just move on to the definition of RSS. So usually when you have regression lines, you try to minimize RSS. So what is RSS? Residual sum of square, um, sum of square, is summation of your observations minus your model squared. So let me remind you what is our model. Our model y hat was the model you estimated beta 0 plus beta 1 x1 and you can go all all up to beta p xp. So I, if I just replace y hat to this, my RSS will become summation of my observations uh, minus beta 0 minus summation of beta i's xi's i from 1 to p squared. So usually we want to minimize this RSS and that is our goal. We, we achieve that through um, minimum least square. So we're usually trying to minimize this RSS. Uh, we are uh, estimating this. So beta zeros up to beta p's that we found are estimating that. Now let's assume you want to put a penalty for for those values which are more than zero or positive or are positive or negative and that's called um, that that's the notion be, behind ridge regression. In ridge regression, ridge regression what you do is that not only do you try to minimize RSS but you penalize your coefficient to be too large, specifically if they're not equal, uh, so different from zero. In this way, you put more emphasis on the coefficients that are larger, uh, that are more, that are going to uh, affecting our variable more. Here, uh, your model tries to find beta zero to beta j's that minimize this part, but also by 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 adding this term to it, uh, we put in penalty for non-zero uh, or, or very different from zero coefficients. So we are trying to minimize this simultaneously. So by changing this lambda, which is uh, something more equal than zero all the time, we're putting more and more penalty. For example, if lambda goes to infinity, that means we put a lot of penalty on having non-zero coefficients. 
we force our model to only have beta 0. If we set our lambda to 0, we have our normal minimized least square method. So by, by shifting this lambda, we are changing beta. So in next next slide, and this lambda makes our variables to shrink. Um, so this part of that function is called shrinkage penalty. Because you put a penalty on uh, positive values or negative values on beta j's because it's squared. So uh, your model tries to shrink those values that are not going to affect your model that much to zero and this lambda serves as a control for that. So choosing lambda is a critical factor so whenever you don't know how to choose a parameter one to unit you use cross-validation. Okay so let's uh, review what we have. So we try to shrink our model by imposing that extra term when we minimize RSS and we want to see how that works. So uh, let's look at our credit information. That was our credit balance, that, that's the information of credit balance on 10 variables. So we have limit, we have rating which is in blue, we have this yellow which is whether or not that person is student, we have this black one which is income, and we have a bunch of other variables, marital status and so on and so forth. We want to see how changing lambda will change our choices of the coefficients. So here we have six coefficients. We see as we increase lambda, um, these coefficients tend to become smaller and smaller. So these coefficients are virtually going to converge to zero. But when we change this lambda so much, all other coefficients we have will tend to converge to zero as well. Specifically when we have very large lambda like 10,000 like this one, all of our coefficients are uh, going to get closer and closer to zero. Um, in right hand side, we have the relative magnitude of betas based on different lambdas in comparison to the magnitudes we had. Uh, that, this, this is norm 2. We ha you had it before. And this is actually square root of beta 1 squared minus beta bar uh, plus beta 2 squared minus beta bar and so on and so forth. So that's beta 1 squared plus beta p squared. So here in this graph, we have the relative magnitude of what you get from lambda divided by the relative magnitude of what you get from simple regression line. This is simple regression line norm. Norm in simple regression line. This is the norm you get for different lambdas. So when you shrink things, uh, you get smaller lambda. That's why um, the relative differences or relative uh, ratio of beta lambdas on beta will start going smaller and smaller. Sorry for the interruption. That was uh, a video that, was, that I saved. So, yeah, now I have a better control over my pen. So when when we shrink this part a lot, that means we use a very large lambda, our betas become zero. Uh, our norm in SRL will not change, so that is that is the case we shrunk our data so much. Here when uh, when we have the value one that means our norms are equal to norms of we get from SRL. That's, that's for the cases that lambda is zero. So here, lambda is actually zero. Here, lambda is very large. So by choice of lambda, 
by increasing lambda, we tend to decrease our coefficients. And that's something happens uh, for all coefficients, specifically non-important coefficients. So, so choosing the correct lambda is, so here I, I just reiterated what I taught earlier, what is norm 2 and how we deal with that and what, what's the use of that. So one thing um, I want to emphasize is that choosing lambda is important. Which lambda? is the best. So whenever you do not, you want to tune in a variable, how do you do that? You use cross-validation to tune it, right? Okay, so one of the problems of using shrinkage methods like this is that um, depending on how you, uh, so depending on how you measure your variables, the variables, your story will change. Your story will change. Let me explain it in a bit. Your story will change. So let me explain what I mean. So let's work on another example. So, in simple linear regression lines, let's say you want to uh, predict your balance uh, based on your income. So let's say you, you measure income in $1,000. So that's model one. In model one, you measure income in thousand dollars. In model two, you measure them in dollars. So beta one in model one, beta one in model one will simply be one thousandths of beta one in model two. because of these measurement differences. However, when you want to try to shrink things, choosing the units like this will affect your shrinkages. So, so, so the model you get from the cases when you have measured your income in thousands will be too much so much different from the cases that you measured in dollars. So that is why it's essential to um, standardize your data. That's a way to standardize your data and that that makes sure that your models are not too different. So if you change each of your, if you divide each of your variables by um, sum square, the average sum square of all variables, it's called standardization. And in this case, when you do that, um, you make sure uh, you do not have any measurement error. When you standardize it, you don't have any unit error anymore so that is a unit less thing so that's why I suggest you you always standardize your data before uh, working with shrinkage because if you do not one of the problems that may occur will be um, will be uh, having non-equal sample uh, unequal unit uh, units that uh, that from one using one unit to another one, the model that is going to um, be chosen will be different. So now let's look at the bias variance trade-off. Remember, we had these uh, trades of uh, trade-offs in perhaps chapter two of the perhaps in some of the very first chapters we worked on. Uh, we earlier said whenever you have more uh, flexible um, models, so more flexibility. So when you increase flexibility, when you increase your flexibility, your bias will go down, your variance goes up. Sorry, goes up. 
your variance okay let me erase this one okay your variance goes up so when you increase flexibility your bias goes down your variance goes up um, and, and that's the thing we can observe here your bias here is the black one so if you increase lambda you're imposing more restrictions so you're losing flexibility uh, that's why you increase your bias so so in this direction flexibility actually goes down you're imposing more lambda means less flexibility that's that's why your bias goes up and your variance goes down there is a sweet spot here which is the uh, best amount of flexibility we have to choose how do we find this by cross validation and that's the same thing in um, when, when you look at the norm of your variables on norm of your uh, in comparison to norm of least square that's exactly the same thing uh, we, we see bias variance uh, notion here uh, flexibility goes this way so if you go this way flexibility increases flexibility increases so this green one is our bias uh, is our variance this is our bias we have a sweet spot here sorry uh, this is our bias let me see no, again, um, when we increase our flexibility, when we increase, oh, okay, flexibility goes this way. We increase our flexibility. Um, so let me check here, let me double check that part, that notion. Okay, so let's look at flexibility. So here, we have norm zero that means it's a very restrictive case here is flexibility so here we increase flexibility yeah we increase our flexibility we see variance goes up bias went down and this is the sweet spot we're looking after good one of the problems of losing using Ridge like regression is that no matter what model you use, you always get beta i is different from zero. So no matter what you do, you always get you usually get um, beta i's that are not equal to zero. For instance, let me get to the other thing. So for instance, if you have a model like this, remember this is just an example that no value but the exam being an example beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 x 2 beta p x p so in rigid regression no matter what tuning set you get you usually get beta i is different from zero so you have all p-values, and that's not desirable. You, you want to use this model to get rid of some of the values. Actually, it turns out there is an easy fix to take care of that, and that is called using lasso. Lasso takes care of that. With, with one easy change, it enforces um, uh, some variables to become zero. So in lasso, which is very close to the... The, to the idea of uh, uh, ridge regressions, you, you, you try to minimize RSS, but instead of adding it to lambda summation of beta i squares, you add this absolute values here. So exactly the same thing, you add absolute values. Actually, summation of absolute values is called norm 1. Um, it's slightly technical and mathematical, but if you have two variables, uh, the boundary that you get from beta 1 and beta 2 will look like this in normal. Anyhow, I, I just, okay, 
I will explain this later. So the only difference the lasso has with reg regression is that instead of beta j uh, square, we have uh, absolute value of beta j. Everything else is the same, but a great thing is the rate regression shrinks the coefficient exactly to zero. So it shrinks the regre uh, regression coefficients of the coefficients that are not important at all to zero. And that is why nowadays, um, in many real-world applications, people use lasso instead of ridge regression. Uh, so let's let's look at some simulated data for the same income uh, for the same credit data. As you can see, when lambda was increased, some of our variables, which are are not important variables, converge exactly to zero here. And that's the power of that. Uh, you may ask yourself. What is the dif difference of using summation of lambda that to lambda summation of beta squares? I will explain it in one of the pictures, which is slightly mathematical. But I promise you, you will enjoy looking at it. Uh, so b before going there, I have to remind you um, about some some notations. So. So I, I, I want to explain mathematically why we will have these, uh, why when we consider lasso and we consider uh, lambda times summation of absolute values of beta, we always get zero for, for non-important variables and very it's not the case on beta too. To do that, I have to reconsider the notion of uh, dual of maximization problems. The same problem that we described in uh, Lasso can be explained as a maximization problem which has some restrictions. This is called a restriction. And this is, this is Lasso. And this is um, this is bridge regression. So instead of writing Lambda times this, we can we can add uh, a budget constraint and and constraints, and by that I can just explain why we have this. That's a very interesting topic. So the shape of this objective function in both of these cases is ellipsoid functions. So the functions you get based on beta i's look like this. These are different ellipsoids you have. And this is our, uh, and here we have some constraints which are in the case, in the sense of beta j square and beta j. So, so let's look at these two functional forms. So you are trying to minimize these ellip uh, ellipsoids based on a constraint you have. Remember we had this constraint. One of the constraints we had was summation of beta j's less than s. Another was summation of beta j squares is less than s. So this can be shown, let's say we have two betas, we have beta 1 and beta 2. So this constraint, so this is, this is constraint, corresponds to this formula. So remember beta 1 squared plus beta 2 squared equal to r squared is a formula of a circle. So this circle corresponds to this. Actually this is a circle with radius square root of s. This constraint can be shown by this shape. This is actually beta 1 plus beta 2 less or less or equal than s and this is again s. So this is another constraint. So we are trying to minimize the possible ellipsoid functions that we can get from beta 1 and beta 2 and the first time it touches um, this constraint we, we have minimized it. So if you have a constraint in the shape of 
circle, this ellipsoid function will touch it here. So you have positive beta 1 and positive beta 2. But if you have a stricter shape like this, like, like this, it will only touches it on one of the corners. So more, uh, so, so since we have some very steep, uh, uh, very steep curves here, it, it, it touches the uh, corners of this function. And that is why in lasso, the optimized version has beta 1 is equal to 0 and some positive beta 2. And the same objective function with circle, um, circle um, constraint, which touches the has has an optimal solution, which has both positive um, positive answers. Another thing I want you to notice is that this is more restrictive constraint than this one, and that is probably perhaps why um, we always get some non-zero some zero coefficients. Again, let's look at some differences of lasso and regression analysis. Usually, lasso does perform better because it gets uh, gets rid of the uh, nonsense variables faster, specifically if you use cross-validation. So, so, which one should we use, lasso or rich regression? I, my suggestion was to use lasso, but depending on the um, depending on the uh, applications, you may use lasso or ridge regression. How do we um, how do we know which one to use? We never know. We should use cross validation to know which one performs better. And how do we tune the parameter for lasso? It's it's extremely easy. You exactly do the same thing as you do in cross validation. What it means is that you divide your data set into test and training data sets. So let's say this is four fold cross validation. Each time you assign some part to test, some part to training, you use your training data set and test it on test data set and take an average of all the um, all the uh, errors you get and finally you choose the and, and you change lambda for and, and you change lambda and find cross validation error for each lambda and choose the one that gives us the cross uh, least amount of cross validation error so let that's that's basically what i've described and here are some pictures showing god uh, which lambda is minimizing our data set. So this is our cross-validation, 10-fold cross-validation errors based on different lambdas and it's minimized here. So that would be the, the, um, the optimal level of uh, model we choose. Uh, so I forgot what was black and red and yellow so let's get back to the uh, Okay, income is black, limit was red, rating was blue, and student was yellow. So, so the student coefficient is 150 in the optimal sense. Credit rating is uh, 200 and something. This, uh, the other variable is 300 and something at this optimal level. And lastly, the, the coefficient of my last variable is this much. Everything afterwards is zero. We can do the same thing for lasso, and again we can we can just use the coefficient that minimizes my uh, my uh, cross validated there. Okay, I I think I have to stop here because the dimension regression methods has not comprehensively been um, explained in the textbook specifically here. So principal component methods haven't been described. So let me wrap up what was covered in the course today. We've worked on two types of shrinkage methods. 
string cage methods. We've worked on ridge regression. and also lasso. So in rig regression you're trying to minimize summation of your uh, model squared, uh, the error of your model squared plus lambda summation of beta i's squared. In lasso you're trying to minimize the same thing that is RSS plus lambda of summation of absolute values of beta i's. Um, ridge regression always leaves you some non-zero coefficients for all beta i's. The, the lasso uh, forces some of these coefficients to become zero. One thing you need to do is before running this is to standardize all your data. and uh, know which when to use one. When you have, when in reality most of your data is different from zero, ridge regression works better. If in reality some of your data is exactly equal to zero, using lasso is better. The reason lasso works better is because of the constraints that are linear, very sharp changes, and when you want to minimize your RSS based on this very sharp case, it touches the uh, the coefficients at, at the corners and that's why it forces some of them to be zero. For example here beta 1 is equal to zero, beta 2 is a positive number. So that concludes our course for chapter 6. In next lectures I'm going to speak with uh, about uh, using R. Thank you.